grace and peace be unto you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. What a blessing it is when we gather in worship, both in person as well as online, wherever and however we are. Again, um, as we are in the sanctuary building itself, we are asking that the masks and social distancing uh, remain in place. Um, and you'll notice that I've removed mine in order for the clarity of worship to be heard and seen in a better fashion. Um, the 2021 offering envelopes are available in the church narthex. Please be sure to sign the sheet when you take yours. If you have never gotten one before and you are interested in having one, if you go down through the roster sheet and find a number that doesn't have a name beside it, and then get the co-aligned um, bundle of envelopes, make that be yours, sign the roster, and take those for your use in this year. Uh, we are continuing to support the efforts of the local food bank as well as uh, the Wolf Pack program, and so donations toward that can be clearly labeled Feeding His Flock. An announcement for the church treasurers, it is time for the annual audit. Um, your books and financial statements are due to the church no later than today, so please be attentive to that. Um, it was announced again last Sunday. Uh, with the new clergy appointment, and so Rick Helsel will be pastoring um, Good Shepherd in the forthcoming year, and his spouse Heidi, uh, Reverend Heidi Helsel, will be pastoring the Marionville Charge. Um, and so we have a clergy couple in our community uh, working together um, in this new appointed season. Let us gather our minds then as we open with a word of prayer. Creator and maker of all things, we come before you wherever and however we are. Just as we heard in the scriptures, you flooded the earth long ago, and we were given a sign, the rainbow. A reminder that your covenant is with the whole earth, that you will never again destroy the earth by flood. Your covenant. It comes to us as a reminder that the world is still broken and yet you strive to make it whole again. We have failed and fallen short, but you have remained steadfast. Your love for us has never ceased. Though we have wandered and sought after the world's desires, call us back, O oh God, to your covenant. Remind us of how you formed the world and made us into your image. Remind us that we come from you and that we return to you and your promises never end. You continue to make all things new and so in you we find our worship today in the name of Jesus Christ our Savior. As we open then in our scriptures, we turn to Psalm 147 this morning. Psalm 147, and I am reading from one. My paper says one. Psalm 25, verses 1 through 10, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me for you are the God of my salvation, for you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions according to your steadfast love. Remember me, for your goodness sake, O Lord. 
good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths the Lord shall seek and steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we come before our God and a praying community, we lift up those desires for prayer as well as joys before us. So there are concerns that we lift before our God today. Cassie. Let us turn our hearts then in an attitude of prayer this time. Lord God, for your rich blessings we come. Still our hearts. Fill our souls. Whisper words of wisdom before us. Lord, we pray over our individual hearts, our community, our commonwealth, our nation, our world. May the wisdom of your divine reflection Show us the path of peace. May we find reconciliation in the midst of the chaos that becomes overwhelming. May we find that the greatest of all rulers is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the triumphant Savior. There are many voices that crowd our hearing. Rumblings and murmurs <coughs> of earthly, human, failing voices. Lord, we need more of you and less of us. And so sinners of your choosing, sinners of your calling, we hear you whispering our name today, calling us to come close. And so, oh God, may this be a time of prayerful worship, reflection, and discernment. Certainly, oh God, just as we pray for our sinner's heart to find salvation, we pray for those who are not just sin sick, but physically sick. Those that are downtrodden and broken physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. Lord, we place them before you as you are truly the great physician. And the mere mortals are nothing but instruments in your hand. So in the midst of everything that we do and say, may we look to you first and foremost. May we place you into the center of every one of our relationships. <coughs> and in doing so, those relationships become a gift offering before God. 
And so God reached down into our lives today. Stir us. Warm our hearts. Remind us that you choose us. And as your chosen people, may we find the worshipful celebration and praise that in spite of all brokenness, you continue to be the wonder worker, the miracle maker, and the savior. And so, oh God, we come lifting that prayerful understanding. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we continue in our attitude of worship, then may we reflect over the musical provision that is given to us today. Our gospel reading for the day comes from Mark, the first chapter. As we're looking in the New Revised Standard Version today, verses 9 through 15, Mark 1, 9 through 15. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. <clears throat> and the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. 
Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. May God add his blessing to the reading, the hearing, the understanding, and the warming of all of our hearts as we come to full knowledge of this, the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, what we have in our gospel reading out of the gospel of Mark is a parallel scripture reading that we see in the other gospels. When I say parallel, it means that the same component story can be found in the similar gospel. And yet, Mark takes a different avenue of approach with regard to what happens. As this is the first Sunday in the season of Lent, this scripture reading shows us as a reminder that everything that Jesus Christ does is for you and I in the Nowhere else in any other religion, anywhere else around the world, has a God, the God, who empties himself out of sacrificial love. And it starts all the way at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. Because it says, he comes up out of the waters and God parts the skies. And the Holy Spirit descends and the message comes out loud and clear. This is my son. This is my son. Now, none of the people who were standing around watching this initial baptism take, take place, who were disciples of John the Baptist, none of, none of them were fully prepared to have an understanding at that point in time that this man coming up out of the water would give the greatest of all gifts to all of humanity for all of time. And the greatest of all gifts is that he would die a sinner's death so that you and I, who are the true sinners, would not have to. There is no other religion out there that offers that. There is no other divine character out there that offers that. What we know to be the way, the truth, and life is that Jesus Christ is the one and true God who gives us the freedom, the salvation, the reconciliation which changes everything. Now it doesn't just it doesn't just stop with the baptism. In fact, I, I think we we spend a decent amount of time with an understanding about what occurs through this baptismal placement. For me, where I want to dwell a little bit is in the words that follow that, because it says, immediately after he has had the Holy Spirit come down from heaven and God speak words, it says, the Spirit... And in my scriptures, Spirit is with a capital S. So we know that the Spirit that's being referred to is the Holy Spirit. The one true part of the three in one that remains with us to this very day. We know that God the Creator establishes all of this wonderment. We know that Jesus Christ is the one who gives us the earthly salvation 
But Jesus Christ tells all of his disciples then and now, I'm going to be leaving you, but I'm going to leave you one that is even greater than me. And it's the Holy Spirit. And so knowing that that placement of that character is right here in this passage of Scripture, and it says, the Spirit immediately drives Jesus out into the wilderness. And it says Jesus was then in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. Now's where the parallels kind of change direction, because in the other Gospel readings, the... The authors take quite a bit of time explaining exactly what it is that took place. In that time, in that place, as far as some of the exact temptations. I kind of resonate with where Mark is in his gospel writing because Mark leaves it completely open. Which is where I need to hear, and I think we as Followers of Jesus Christ need to hear that this 40 days of temptation, they were our temptations. In this Lenten season on our own journey, the question that needs to be asked for you and I individually in our own hearts, what are the very things that causes us to stumble? What are the temptations that we deal with on a daily basis? What causes us to not live for Jesus Christ in fullness, in spoken word, in lived out action, in unspoken words? You know, those things that happen on our face whenever we're not even speaking words. The eye rolls and the sarcastic facial expressions or Maybe I'm the only one that experiences those. Every bit of who we are is meant to be a reflection of Jesus Christ. And when we fall short, and how we fall short, and what causes us to trip and not be a representative of that is exactly where this place of temptation is for us. And to acknowledge that Jesus dealt with every bit of that for 40 days. Now I want you to juxtapose something here. It took Jesus 40 days to deal with all of the temptations that humanity has to deal with, but it only took him three days to overcome the grave of death. The greater thing that you and I deal with in our own lives then shows the gravity of how real those temptations are. If God had to fight our human temptations for 40 days, but he can overcome the sinner's death in three. It certainly, one, shows how great our God is, but it also serves as a reminder for us that the temptations are every bit as real and frustrating, even more so sometimes, than the outward sinful acts. Because sometimes the temptations that we struggle with, we might think that they're pretty innocent. And yet whatever it is that we're struggling with might cause another to stumble and fall. Our stupid actions might feel pretty good to us, but our stupid actions cause someone else to fall in their own journey. It's very real that Jesus reminds us. It's very real, in fact, that the beginning of Jesus' ministry tells us that the Holy Spirit drove him out there. Now I will tell you, in all of my years of ministry, having started all the way back in 1995, one of the questions that perpetually comes to the surface on an almost a daily basis from believers, from followers, from disciples, from seekers, from 
baby Christians is this. Why is God testing me? Maybe even those of us sitting here in this room have heard ourselves ask that question. Why is God testing me? Maybe some of us sitting in this room or out there in the virtual land have asked that question even today. Why is God testing me? And the reality is we can hear it in this passage of Scripture. God is not the one who tests us. Satan is the one who does the constant testing in our lives. But what needs to be heard from this is the Holy Spirit gives us the freedom that you and I will be tested. Even Jesus himself, it says, was driven out into the wilderness to be tested. So we must face those tests in our lives. But the key in all of this is that Jesus will never leave us nor forsake us in the midst of the testing. And as much as I've heard it from my own kids, and as much as I experienced it in my own life, through all academic levels of study, there were those moments when those real tests, those academic tests, those multiple choice tests, those SAT tests, those real graded school-like tests, would cause us to say, mm -hmm, I'll just pray on it, and maybe God will give me the answers. And I remember sitting down for some of those tests that I was ill-prepared for, not read up on, and sitting down there with number two pencil in hand and a bubble sheet on the desk and the questions to be answered, and you look at it and go, I have no earthly idea what they are asking me. Lord, help me now. C, 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 C. <laughs> Those exams in our lives aren't just the ones that come in our academic place. In fact, I think the real tests, the real exams that bubble to the surface throughout our lives often start taking place after we turn 18 and we move out into adulthood. And many of us at times are ill-prepared, not read up, not studied, not in a good place. And we kick it over to God and say, why are you testing me? When the reality is the Holy Spirit is with us. If we but open our ears and our eyes and our heart to see. Now, the expectation then also is that none of us are supposed to be lazy in our Christianity. Because too often we want to do the exact same thing that maybe we did once in our past with those exams in life. Lord, help me now. C, 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 C. We take the most generic path, the easy path, and we pray that God will make sense of the mess that we make for ourselves. There's a reason why Jesus had to take 40 days in overcoming the human temptations that are very real in our lives. The beautiful thing that I hear in this gospel reading that is a little different in comparison to the other gospel readings about this time of temptation is that it says Jesus was not alone. The other gospel readings point blank say all, all of the very specific. 
levels and aspects of that temptation. Mark, however, says, and Jesus was with the beasts, and the angels waited on him. Bob, I almost kind of wish you would have brought Mark with me today. I brought one of my kids. <laughs> because the very promise of that reality is that when in our human walk, God gives us beasts that sometimes do a better job in spiritually awakening us and saving us from ourselves than people who walk on two legs and can speak with human eloquence. It says that in the midst of Jesus being driven out into the wilderness, it took beasts waiting on him and angels taking care of him. Too often, I think, we get caught up in the midst of who we are that we're expecting some kind of a a lightning bolt flash with the headline that reads exactly what it is that we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to do it and maybe even painting the path of exactly how our lives should go when the reality is sometimes we're just supposed to be in the wilderness acknowledging that sometimes it's the beasts of the field that show us the way. Because the difference about beasts and humans is that we have a real tendency to mess everything up. Beasts know exactly how things go, and the natural way of things is that they follow how God set it up. But too often we try and make ourselves be little gods with a small g, not little gods with a capital G, following in God's footsteps. And we can mess everything up. Again, more of the reason why this wilderness journey took 40 days. Because every time Jesus would turn around, there's one more temptation that we throw in his direction. But the other fascinating parallels between Mark and another passage of Scripture actually goes all the way back to the first covenant that was established. And I alluded to it earlier in my prayer because God in his creative power made us. It said, you know, after all of those days of creation, all six days of creation, God took rest on the seventh day. But in every single one of those days, he looked upon whatever it was that was created and he said, and it was good. It was good. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's perfect. It's in my image. But when you and I were created, there was also this little gift that was made called human will. And the human will is the thing that causes the 40 days of temptation because that's the place where we think we know better than God. And we toe the line and we step over the line and we throw things where they're not supposed to be thrown and we touch, you know, things that say don't touch. Because if there's buttons to be pushed, we push them. If there's dials to be turned, we turn them. That's the way we are. Even though the words of instruction say don't do it, we just can't help ourselves. And the first time God tried to deal with this, he flooded the earth. And he looked all over were but one righteous. And so he took Noah and Noah's family and said, I want you to build me an ark. And well over a hundred years, they're sawing and hammering, making this ark. When there hadn't been a drop of rain, and all of the people were looking at Noah and his family going, that man has lost his mind. And 
know in his family we're doing the just you watch and see. Building an ark before there was ever a drop of rain. Watch and see. And when the rains came and flooded the earth, the only ones who were saved was no one in his family and the beasts that were put into the ark. And the angels waited on them. It's in our scriptures. And for 40 days, that ark bobbed along, wiping out the temptations of the world so that there could be a new start. And when the waters dried up, the rainbow was placed into the sky, and God said, never again will I wipe away the creation of the earth by flood. Let this rainbow be a sign in the heavens that my covenant will be that I will take care of you no matter what. And no matter what comes when we see Jesus Christ going all the way through the gates of hell to wipe away the sins of the earth. And all that we are asked to do is to allow our wildness to be tamed. You and I need to be broken sometimes like a wild horse. And as much as we like to fight against God, God wants to take us and make us do something amazing. And he wants to use you just as you are, but not leaving you as you are. Just as I am. May that be our prayer today. That he tames the wildness in us. The season of Lent is about you and I coming face to face with God and hearing that he's willing to go all the way to the ends of the earth, facing every temptation that we throw at him, throwing in for every sinful act, word, action, inaction, every disgusting level of who we are and what we are, and Jesus takes it all. And offers us something amazing over and over and over again. And sometimes it takes the beast of the field to remind us that there is an order to things. And when we try and screw up the order, God shows us that he made it all. And in his creation he said, this is good. <coughs> Not the way we want to mess it up. The way he made it is good. We need to be tamed. But in being tamed by God, it opens up doors of adventure and peace and grace and mercy and love like we've never seen, felt, or heard about. In any other love story but the scriptures. May we go to God today and allow Him to tame the wild that's in us. Lord God, we need you now. We pray that you take every aspect of what is around us and you allow the angels to entertain us, to weigh on us, to care for us. But that 
means that we need to do the most important thing, <coughs> which is to allow the Holy Spirit's presence to show us the way. To see that you love us so much that you would sacrifice your very self for us. And so may we live into that truth. May we be a new creation in your image. Called by God. Harnessed by God. Cared for by God. Forgiven. Loved. When we come before our God, he very simply says, come like little children. Come like little children and bear the light into the world. May that be our call today. And may God richly bless us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may we be blessed to be a blessing in and through the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.